Hey EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast, episode number 41. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I've started this podcast because I believe that companies have to think of themselves as employment brands if they hope to attract and retain talents. The podcast brings a different lens to the employee experience, a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests, all thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way, come to this show to debate, discuss and share best practices on the key components that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create positive employee experiences. One size doesn't fit all. What Airbnb or Google do around the employee experience may not be applicable in a smaller company. This is what this show is all about, sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Brent Schlenker founder of the Training, Learning and Development Community and Center and the TLD Cast podcast. Today with Brands, we will talk about what's the disconnect between programs that learning and development teams create and which programs employees want to actually learn. What are the skills employees must learn to prepare for the future of work? What are the L&D trends that are disrupting the workplace? What place technology play in the delivery and consumption of L&D programs? And how to measure the ROI on learning and development? This episode is brought to you by Fusion Alliance. Fusion Alliance delivers holistic solutions fusing together data, digital and technology to redefine customer experiences and move your ideas to execution. That's why businesses across multiple industries have relied on Fusion's expertise and partnership for over 25 years. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Brent. If you get a chance, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or YouTube. And last thing, if you want to send me feedback, suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummits.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. All right, let's get to the podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX podcast. Today's guest is Brent Schlenker, and he is calling from the sunny Phoenix, Arizona, where he's the founder of the Training, Learning, and Development Community and Conference, or TLDC. Brent, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. So I'll always start with an easy question before we get into more um, complicated question. But the easy question for you, just to make you at ease, is who is Brands and what is TLDC? Uh, well, um, I'll, I'll try to keep it as short as I possibly can. But I'm, I'm uh, a learning professional, a, a training, learning and development professional, just like thousands of others uh, in our industry and have been doing it for over 20 years and have done it with uh, large uh, companies like Intel uh, and much smaller companies doing consulting work and um, engaging with other uh, professional communities throughout my career and uh, helping to be a part of growing large events uh, like DevLearn uh, that I was the program director for for about six years and uh, I just love this community. I love, uh, I love what I do. I love the work of training, learning, and development. And I, I love the people that, um, that choose this line of work. And uh, so it's always been a passion of mine. And um, so, you know, why not make a career out of it? 
And so we did. And with uh, the help of uh, my good friend, Luis Malbus, um, we decided to start TLDC as a way to fill a void in the industry where um, we can utilize newer 21st century technologies to connect a community of professionals on a regular basis. So you mentioned that TLDC is a, a community and a conference. We are, we are a community first above all things. And a conference is just one piece of how we bring that community together. The other piece is a daily live streaming broadcast that we do every morning at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And we also have a 24-7 uh, Slack group that we call TLD Chat. So there's the TLD Cast, which is the morning broadcast. And then there's TLD Chat, which is the 24-7 text-based conversational chat in the, in the tool called Slack. And then, uh, of course, we, have, uh, we do have an event that we do. And, um, and then there's the community as a whole. And everything that um, that they do, really, because all of TLDC and the success of it, um, Luis and I just kind of help it along and facilitate it. But it really is um, through the strength of the community that uh, that it works so well. So, who is working on the twenty four seven TLD chat? Do you have staffing, or is it just people uh, from your network and community just exchanging? A question and answers and input. Yeah, it's basically just it's very conversational. It's yeah, we uh, yeah, it's no nobody in addition to does it. It's just a place for people to hang out. Maybe if you if you're unable to join the conversation for an hour during the live stream because that is collaborative. So we have people chatting with us while we have up to four people on video at any given time, and so um, it becomes a very lively conversation. I will say. Um, and then when the conversation needs to go longer, we just we have to end the show at, um, you know, at the top of the hour every single day. So then we just move the conversation over to the Slack group and, and the community just takes it from there. We, we just have an amazing community of learning professionals that have stepped up and said, I love what you guys are doing and I want to support you. What can I do? And so they, they help us in many, many different ways. And then that's really the power of. Um, community-driven uh, initiatives in general. That sounds great. And we'll share some of the uh, URLs and uh, websites and uh, social media platforms uh, towards the end of this discussion. When I was prepping for our conversation today, I came across quite an interesting finding. 80% uh, of HR leaders believe that training and development is effective at helping people acquire the skills they need to move their careers forward, which makes you know, good sense. 72% of HR leaders feel like the organization provides employees with the ability to easily collaborate and participate in informal learning opportunities. However, on the flip side, employees don't feel the same way. Only one third reported that training and development programs are not too effective uh, or not at all effective, and only 51% of employees agree that the organization provides the right forums for collaboration. So there seems to be a disconnect between how HR leaders think their own programs are effective and how uh, employees perceive the effectiveness of the programs developed by their HR leaders. So why do you think that those two perceptions uh, conflict with each other? Well, I, I will say that when that particular uh, research report came out stating that, it was, uh, it was a very uh, hot topic and uh, drove a lot of conversations And I think all we can really do is speculate. Um, they, I'm, I'm not really sure if there are any specifics around it, but I have some particular guesses. And uh, like I always say in my conversations uh, during TLD cast, um, I, I don't ever feel like my answers to questions like these um, are 
are the most perfect answers. And so I'm always willing to hear somebody else say, no, you're wrong. And I'm more than happy to change my opinion if, if somebody can, uh, can influence me otherwise. So, so with that said, um, I think there's a few, a few different, um, I don't know if trends is the right word, but, um, patterns that I've seen in my career uh, and um, a, a lot of it has to do with just the complexities of organizations and different types of organizations are structured in different ways and have different needs. And unfortunately, um, all too often, there is a one size fits all mentality when it comes to training. And so especially when it comes to the executive level and um, spending money on those programs, there, my guess is at those higher levels, um, HR leaders and other executives within the company feel like they've given their employees everything they need because they know that they've spent a whole lot of money on a lot of software, a lot of enterprise software, a lot of learning management systems, um, a lot of content libraries, um, active all of these different resources. And so in their minds, they've provided more than enough for anybody to be able to uh, get the learning that they might need. But the reality is, and we're seeing this in this data, is if you go and you talk to those employees, it's, uh, you know, the systems are too hard to get connected to. They don't meet the employee where the employee needs to be met. It's very, you know, if they're on a mobile device, they can't get the content on the mobile device. If they're working in a manufacturing area, they don't have access even to a computer except during break times. And, you know, they don't want to spend that time. Um, there's issues with HR where we, um, you know, at executive levels might feel like, oh, this is great. We've given them access to all this so they could very easily be going home and learning and training themselves and accessing all this great content. The only problem is, is that there's also uh, legal responsibilities and HR responsibilities around if somebody is doing work that you've asked them to do, even if it's professional development, sometimes that means the company needs to be paying those employees. So there's, there's just a lot of confusion in that front and understanding, you know, what, what executives have purchased for the company, for the business to sort of check the box and say, yes, we've provided all of this for our employees and what the employees really want. I mean, obviously this, this is, this data is, is making it very, very, very clear that this is the case, but it comes down to organizationally, they're exposing that disconnect between the realities of the workforce and uh, executive leaders. And I think more than anything, that tells a big part of the story right there. Everybody's needs are different and there just isn't a lot of, um, I don't know for lack of a better word, respect between the two different communities. Yes, and I completely agree with you, and I'm, I'm glad that you brought this up because the reason why I started the uh, EX podcast is really because I believe that what companies do well on the customer side, you know, customer research, uh, empathy, journey mapping, customization of the experience to different uh, customer segments or customer groups can be applied to the employee side as well. And again, uh, right now, more than, you know, 40 years ago, uh, brands don't dictate anymore what their brand experience should be to their customers or consumers, right? The consumers yep. are in the driver's seats and they decide what their own experience should be when they interact with the brands. And employees are consumers, so we, we have adopted that consumer mindset to be able to drive our own experiences as consumers and we, yep. we are expecting that we're going to be treated the same way as employees. So I agree with you that um, I think HR leaders and you know, uh, training uh, uh, development leaders should apply a bit more empathy uh, and try to put their sales, themselves in their employees' shoes to ident identify what are the skills that they may need to learn, 
what is the best technology to use, how fragmented the classes should be, etc., etc. So what is your take on this? How, how would you advise an organization now to rethink the way they've developed training and development programs so far? Well, I think a big part of it is understanding the loss of control and being okay with that. Um, I, I have a graphic that I show sometimes um, th that basically um, states, yeah, using characters, um, that uh, command and control is not an option. And it just it isn't anymore when it comes to this, at least if you want to be successful, right? The command and control structure, uh, you know, can still function and still work in certain areas. But if you really want to be a high performing organization, we've already seen that through the data of high performing organizations that they've let go of that. They've let go of that sense of we own everything we know everything that's best for you and we're going to push it at you. High performing organizations will reverse that, understand that the employee is now in control and basically do the same thing that, um, that business to consumer companies are doing. And that is focus directly on what is it that the, um, that the employee needs and try to offer that. And a lot of that comes from data. And that is the biggest part. If there's a way that you can give somebody uh, credit or, um, for going out on YouTube and, and learning something on YouTube, there should be a way that if they've you know improved their performance on the job through means other than what is supplied by the company, that should be you know, valid, and it should still be, uh, I don't know, tracked or um, at least somehow given credit for that, right? And I, I think we're getting there, but it's it's a, it's a long road to go. Um, but we just, I think in general, it's just that idea of letting go and and understanding that um, that that the consumer, that the employee, has a lot more control than they used to have. And um, if if you don't figure out how to be okay with losing that control from a hierarchical level, you're going to be in trouble. So what, what kind of metrics and measurement tools would an organization have to put in place to be able to connect whatever uh, programs or learning programs an employee may go through to their performance? Well, the, the, the technology that right now that is starting to really sweep the industry is called the experience API. Um, it was originally called uh, Tin Can, but um, its its official name is now um, X API or Experience API. And um, there are a lot of folks out there in this industry that can speak more eloquently about <laughs> that particular technology than I can. But the the gist of that technology and why it was even originally conceived of is exactly this purpose, giving, making a very, very portable, simple uh, and flexible uh, database tracking sort of protocol to be able to capture much smaller segments of an employee's learning activities than just whether or not they completed a course and did they get a good grade on it. So we know that obviously technology and mostly digital technology is disrupting the workplace, right? Yep. Um, and people have to adapt and employees have to adapt. You know, they can be trained um, at work. They, there are some skills that they need to learn themselves um, outside of work. So what are the critical skills that you seeing right now that employees have to acquire to even just remain relevant in their jobs uh, yeah i would i would step it back ones and and all and all all speak right directly to the the skills as well but i think before we get to the skills part we have to talk about the mindset and mm -hmm. i think i think employees shifting their mindset to this idea that they own 
their careers. They own their responsibility. They, they have the responsibility to adapt and to continually learn and to, and that learning is now a part of the job, right? There is no more go in, punch the clock, put in your time, punch out, and you're done for the day. All throughout that experience, even if that is your experience, with everything moving as quickly as it is, technology, um, businesses, if you're just basically doing the status quo, then you're basically falling behind. So you're, if you're ever standing still, you're basically going backwards. So the idea is that you need a mindset of I need to constantly be moving forward. And by moving forward, you, you, you need to have this idea that I need to constantly be learning something new. I need to constantly engage uh, the activities that I'm doing. What can I learn from my mistakes? Not be afraid to make mistakes, not be afraid to take chances, to take risks, and to to learn from those and to move on. It's, um, you know, with, with this era of responsibility that we were talking about, right, like the control is now shifting away from the hierarchical leadership to the employee. Okay, that's great. And that is a reality. But the biggest part is, is that that's a big responsibility to employees that unfortunately, I think a large part of our employee base is not ready for. They're, they're not ready to take control of their careers, to, to manage their careers successfully. So I think that mindset has to shift. Once that mindset shifts, then we get into, okay, what kind of skills should they be focusing on and where should they be um, placing their attention? And um, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said there and probably more than we can cover in this podcast, but, um, so, you know, so some... just, sorry, just before we get maybe in some, some of the specificities of the skills that, you know, maybe are required moving forward for most of the employees. So let me ask you just to bounce back on what you were saying. Is, is it, is there an expectation on either side or maybe both sides that the employer should provide employees all the training they need, or is there an expectation from the employees to even define their own curriculum and define what skills they need to learn without relying so much on directions from the employers? I think a lot of that is dependent upon at what point of your career that you're in. I think I think now more than ever during these times, um, coaching and mentorship is going to become an extremely um, popular reality. And not in the sense that we want to formalize these into, you know, formal programs and all of that. Well, while that will probably happen too, a lot of times that that kills the idea, that that kills the dream. But I think in general, it is, you know, if you are new in your career, if you're new in the job that you're working in, you're not going to know what you don't know. So you are going to have to connect with somebody that's more experienced and older and trust in them to be able to uh, help guide you in getting to where that mentor is or that coach is or whoever's helping you move forward and having those conversations. And, and that's where collaboration and um, connection with community and, uh, you know, being engaged and involved in your, um, you know, professional groups, professional organizations are going to be more important than ever. And that, that to me is the, the real critical piece. And same with, you know, if, if managers, um, senior executives, if they really, really want to do a good job of keeping their employees, they have to start looking at, the fact that a they can actually learn something they don't they're not the smartest people in the room anymore the the new gra college graduate that you know just came into the company probably has a lot of skills and knowledge that they could learn from the whole idea of reverse mentoring with the newbies you know even coaching the the senior executives mm -hmm. it's a it's a popular trend going on right now but it but in general i mean just you know put that aside just knowing that, listen, if you're going to hire somebody to come in, the name of the game for that new hire is I want upward mobility. I want to be learning. I want to have an engaging experience working for this company. I want to be valued. I want my ideas 
to be respected and I want to be, you know, constantly learning, constantly showing value and constantly being effective in my job. And if as a senior executive or a hiring manager, if you can't offer that to that employee, then you're going to lose that employee and you're, you're going to get somebody else that really isn't that motivated or isn't that willing to step up and do the things that you, that you really, really want somebody to be doing in your business. And so it's, it's as much a mind shift at the senior levels as it is um, in the rank and file. It's interesting because at the same time, it is, you know, more and more the expiration dates of what we may learn in in college um, is so that expiration date comes sooner and sooner. Maybe you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, what you learned in college, you could pretty much apply it for over a long period of time, maybe over a couple of decades. Now, what you learn in college may be irrelevant five years after you graduate. Right, so that that's a period of you know time where you can use hundred percent of what you learn and just rely on what you learn. It becomes shorter and shorter, and you continue to have to develop new skills as the technology evolves. Basically, oh, absolutely, and that's that's the next major disruption, and that is that is exactly what we're seeing. Uh, you know, L and D organizations and and corporate training organizations are are going through some disruptions, but, um, you know, higher ed institutions um, and our, our educational systems are being uh, disrupted in significant ways right now and connecting the, the needs of the community, the needs of the business world, the needs of enterprises to help them get and, and to, uh, you know, recruit qualified candidates that can keep up uh, you know, everything on the educational institution side needs to change. I mean, you can you can even, you know, hear it and see that in um, in new startups. Uh, I know uh, at least a handful of venture capitalists and um, entrepreneurs that when they start up companies, they, they the last person they want on their team is a Ph.D. level uh, super educated person because they don't want somebody that's going to overanalyze everything in their experience. They, they haven't found anybody that's got the tenacity and the grit and the, you know, the ability to, um, just go for it the way somebody that has had to grind out their, you know, career and learn a skill and be good at it and then shift and change and do the next skill and, and to be nimble and to be able to make decisions on the fly without, you know, being afraid of failing and not having to analyze the heck out of everything. So that th- that, that's, an int- that's an interesting uh, topic because, you know, our, I've read uh, a few articles around w- what are the next uh, type of skills that are going to emerge or become more and more important. And, it's mostly more and more about the soft skills or the human skills versus the the technical or the hard skills. Knowing that, you know, uh, being able to show empathy, being able to coach and mm-hmm. mentor, being able to relate to people's emotions, those are going to become more and more important as we rely more and more on technology to do well, yeah. and to automate the work. Right. Well, and the, even the the more extreme irony is that more and more companies are putting a lot of value in the arts and in um, you know just understanding, having basic understanding of of um, you know anything artistic or design related, whether whether that's architectural design and engineering bent and and designing and you know that creative side of things. And yet, what is it that schools are pushing so heavily right now and crushing all of the other programs? It's STEM, right? I mean, they everybody wants science, technology, <laughs> and math, and they push it like crazy. But really, at the end of the day, a lot of these companies end up finding out that the most creative and the most innovative employees 
are the art history majors. The, the, the ones who um, think differently are the ones who approach those social sciences, right? And do engage and do have some level of understanding, empathy, or just seeing the world in a, in a different bent, you know, yes, we do need a lot of that science and technology and all of that stuff. Absolutely. But to your point, that kind of stuff can be gotten very, very quickly and it changes all the time. The stuff that really sticks with you and really makes you human is that empathy side, being able to look at something and respect it for its lines, right? Being able to look at nature and understanding the colors of things or, you know, being able to just, you know, embrace somebody's painting as odd as it may be and having a level of respect for it, right? And, or music, you know, being, uh, you know, creative in that sense, right? Those, those folks are always the ones that people really enjoy having that end up being really successful as if they can, you know, spread out their time and they have other interests and other hobbies. You know, so, the, the overly schooled are becoming um, less and less wanted. So let's go a little deeper on, on this and that aspect of collaboration of people from, from different backgrounds and different mindsets because as we discussed earlier, the workplace is dramatically, dramatically changing. You know, there are less barriers such as you know, geographical barriers, depart departmental barriers, technical barriers and others. But this, which means that people need to connect and to collaborate on projects or on group learning activities with ease so that they can, um, so they, they can work, learn and grow together. Right, there's that sense of togetherness, that sense of community, uh, that sense of collaboration that is becoming more and more important. So how do companies need to approach those trends, in your opinion? I, I think that's a hard one to answer uh, just from, a, from, an ex from my perspective of the experiences that I've had. It's, it's complicated, and I think... Um, I think people try to oversimplify it, right? And they, they oh, and think that there's going to be some sort of magic algorithm that's going to put the right diverse set of people together in a room and that's going to make for a powerful team. And I think more than anything, um, those powerful teams that come together are ones that have spent a lot of time together and have gone through that process of building those strong relationships and being able to function uh, together. There's there, On the flip side of that, there are those people who just are exceptionally skilled at uh, being new in a group. So the gig economy, right, that they talk mm -hmm. about where, where teams form for brief periods of time. Okay, great. You don't have a lot of time to build relationships, but that required social skill that's needed is being able to navigate a diverse group of people, a diverse group of thoughts, and having that empathy, understanding that you're not the smartest person in the room and uh, it, what you say, you know, managing, you know, that that sense of engagement with folks is, is a different set of social skills than somebody who is really, really, really effective on a team that's been a long standing team that's been together for a long period of time. I, and, I, and I think there's different personalities that function on both ends of that spectrum. And that's something that I don't really read about or hear about being looked at too closely because it's very, um, you know, it's soft skills. It's not, it's very unmeasurable, but you know it when you see it. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's some employee data uh, and some industry benchmarks that organizations can leverage to identify, you know, what type of personalities, what type of uh, specific sc technical skills I may need on my team to be able to get these products at the door, right? But at the same time, you know, having a collaboration mindset is not necessarily innate. It has maybe to, you know, we may have to train people on how to better collaborate together. So do you see that um, in learning and development, we'll see 
more and more uh, trainings around how to help people better collaborate? I, I think there should be. And I think that probably there are some libraries out there that are being created to do that because you're right. I mean, the, the industries see it as a problem. We, you know, the, the enterprise sees it as a problem. New venture startups see the problem and it's, it's a significant issue. But again, it's, it's, I think it's, some people will scoff at it because in general, what you're saying is let's put together some training on how to be nice. <laughs> Right. And as, as right. And you're laughing because that's silly, right? That sounds very silly. But I can tell you right now that I've engaged with people just today that I think need that training. Mm -hmm. Adults. Right. And and it is you you would think that everybody would know how to just be nice and how to engage with other people and how to respectfully uh, engage in dialogue and to have a differing opinion and be able to be nice about your opinion being different than theirs. But unfortunately, those are skills that, you know, should be learned and should be taught or facilitated throughout your life growing up. And it apparently <laughs> in our particular world, you know, the internet has exposed the fact that there is a large supply of people who just simply do not know how to be nice. Oh, yeah, I would agree with that. Um, so let, let me ask you this, because we, we talked a little bit earlier about the consumers, consumerism of experiences. As consumers, now there's a trend um, on the employee side as well. We're talking more and more about employee experience. And we, we, we consume learning in a different way than decades ago, right? It's more fragmented. We want learning on demand. As you mentioned earlier, there are, you know, we use multiple channels to learn. Uh, people may learn listening to a podcast or whatever it might be on the commutes to work for 15, 20, 30 minutes. They may not be able to sit for an hour or two hours long on the computer or in a classroom. But again, we have to shift that mindset so then when organizations develop training programs, they have to keep in mind how those programs are going to be consumed and digested by, by the employees, by the recipients, basically. So what, what do you see happening in the marketplace right now? Yeah, this well, this is where another major change comes in, and I know a lot of my peers will will argue with me on this point, but I think we are very rapidly shifting away from a a training and course centered approach to a resource centered approach, and by that I mean, uh, you know, the part that needs to be focused on is the goal, right? Give, you know, what is it that these employees need to do on the business, their performance, right? What is it that they're trying to do? Give them the resources and the ability to go and the access. This is the other key that I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned is that if you, as long as you give them access to the proper resources. And by that, I don't mean just digital resources and, you know, the, the resources and the content that's supplied by um, corporate, right, then internally. But I'm talking about the, the entire ecosystem of resources that are available. There's all the external resources, there's internal resources, and there's people, right? Being able to access the right person to ask the right question Two is often the best channel, the best first channel. If you can't get access to that real live person, the next thing you do is, okay, let me see if I can find a document or let me see if I can find a resource or, a, or something out there. More often than not, the very last resort that anybody will do is sign up for an hour long or a day long training course. And that is going to be the, the common thread moving forward. Now, of course, again, this depends a lot on where you're at in your learning. If you're, you know, brand new to a particular topic or a particular skill set, 
sorry, I had to cough. Um, you know, you, you might be um, the type of structured formalized personality that knows enough to say, okay, in order for me to kickstart this new skill or this new um, topic that I want to master, I need to get myself into a class and, and get engaged with other people that want to learn this same topic, going back to school or signing up for a, a day-long class or doing an e-learning seminar online um, it is a great way to start. But I would argue that most professionals that are out there in the workplace have the basic skills of most of the things that they need to do. More often than not, they just need a refresher. They just need, uh, you know, something specific. We all have basic math skills. And so we're not going to go all the way back and take, you know, adding and subtracting 101 to get leveled up to be able to do solve a physics problem, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's all contextual and based on your prior knowledge, your prior experience and where you're at. And so I just believe that if we could cut the resources loose, make it easy for people to access other people and digital content and allow those folks that are more senior that have a lot of knowledge, allow them to create content that can then be shared back freely, right? No gatekeepers, no filtering, no, no polishing up of it, but letting everybody share their knowledge and let the community police the, the effectiveness and the quality, then you will begin to see rapid changes and people starting to say, oh, if that's training, I want more of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, th that's, that's probably the toughest question of all. In my opinion, learning performance and engagements are inextricably linked. Now, the question is, how do you measure the ROI on learning and development and its impact on business outcomes? Because as you said earlier, Organizations may spend thousands, if not millions of dollars in training for the employees, depending on how big or small those organizations are. But it's, it, it has to be measurable. It, it has to be, you have to be able to connect or to, um, to measure the impact on the business um, in order to continue to spend money, basically, or make sure that the money that you've spent or the curriculums that you've created are making an impact in our being um, productive. Right. And this is, this is where we make a shift as professionals from being instructional designers and creating instructional problems and measuring somebody's learning, where we shift from that perspective to the perspective of, a, a, you know, there's all sorts of buzzwords out there and people trying to come up with new titles for what we do. And so I'll throw out a couple, but, you know, in essence, there's, you know, a performance engineer, uh, you know, a, a performance consultant, you know, things like that. But at the end of the day, the ROI, nobody needs to know or have an ROI on learning. The only person that cares about an ROI on learning is the person that's actually learning and doing the learning. It's the application of that learning and the measurement of the outcomes from that application that are the most critical. So as a learning and development professional, you need to get engaged with the business and find out what it is that the business is measuring. They wouldn't come to you and you wouldn't be able to help them if there weren't already some baseline um, you know, data points that the business is looking at. And they maybe have tried, let's say they want to increase something by, you know, 10%. And they've tried a whole bunch of different things, uh, you know, and, um, you know, they just they're not too sure what else, you know, to do. But you've got a good baseline from a business metric what you want to have done. Right. If you go in as an L&D professional and say, um, OK, they just need training. And all you do is measure that everybody went through this training and they sat in a chair <laughs> or they took an e-learning yeah, course measurements. Yeah, no, nobody's going to care, right? If you insist on understanding those business metrics and crafting your learning content or your learning solution and your the learning experience that you create based on that context, now after that intervention is put into place, 
people can see those business metrics, whether they went up or down. Now, could it have been some other random factor that happened at the exact same time that boosted it? Absolutely. But those are the things that we need to be looking into and understanding. And if, you know, if we don't even take the time to understand the business, then we don't even have a shot at it. So we might as well go take a shot at it and engage and try to figure out those business outcomes. So we're getting close to the conclusion of this conversation. So before we wrap it up, let me ask you some fun questions and obviously probably a bit easier questions to answer and lighter questions as well. But I really enjoyed our conversation. I think it's a fascinating topic uh, around learning and development and how how it's changing in the workplace. Because what what I learned, uh, even at the beginning of my career, is completely different from what I'm, what I'm learning right now. And I do love do love that aspect that it's continuous improvement. It never stops. Right? Yep. So uh, if you were to invite a, a historical figure or someone famous to dinner, who would that be and why? Uh, you know, it, it's such a great question. And it, it, I guess it's, uh, um, it, boy, it's pretty standard, I guess, for most people. But I would have to say Jesus, um, just uh, it, for no other reason. You know, he's popular for his dinners. So <laughs> um, if it's going to be inviting a historical figure to dinner, let's invite him back. I never had that one. That's a good answer. Um, what is your favorite vacation spot? Uh, oh, I would have to say easily um, Coronado Island in San Diego, um, only because it's close to my house. We've we've been there many times as a family, we've built uh Lots of memories there with the kids growing up, and um, yeah, it just uh, it it there's there's always a certain feeling we get when we pull in to uh, go across that bridge and, and land on the islands. So it's all good. All right, so let let's talk about islands. If if you were to go on a deserted islands, what are the three survival items that you would take with you? Oh man, that's got to be the toughest question. <laughs> Um, it's a deserted island, so no power. You can't say Wi-Fi. You can't say, "Oh, I will take my iPad." It's I just can't. Can, can I say my? Island. Can I? Can I say bringing a solar charger? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then bring the iPad or uh, <laughs> uh, and, a, and a satellite phone. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, boy, I, you know, I think it's, it's an interesting question because, you know, when you think about those types of technologies um, being so readily available these days, uh, it, it seems like y y nobody should be deserted on a desert island anymore. Uh, having access to um, easy solar power, uh, easy connectivity, um, you know, but. Uh, I know it's like, what do we do when we upgrade it's different. Right? Um, yeah. So, what is your favorite food? Oh boy, I, you know, it, uh, of course, my family would would call me on it, uh, but they would they my um, my my guilty pleasure is ice cream. Yeah, I I, uh, I I love ice cream. I should not love it, and I should stop. But um, I do love ice cream. What type of ice cream? You know, um, anything with a with a chocolate or a fudge to it, but not too extreme. So currently, I'm a big fan of Moose Tracks. It's a Midwestern thing. Uh, okay. It's Reese, like little Reese's Pieces cups and swirled chocolate inside of vanilla. Good. It sounds pretty good. And what is your, let's say, um, what is your personal motto? Oh, man. Um, you know what I like to say, and it always sticks in my head. I, I, um, I borrowed it from the great poet, um, Nikki Six of Motley Crue. Uh, if, uh, if you want to live your life on your own terms, you've got to be willing to crash and burn. Oh, that's a very good one. Uh, I love it. So what is the way for our listeners to follow you and TLDC on social media? 
Uh, boy, the best way to do it is uh, Twitter is a great place to do it. My Twitter handle is B-S-C-H-L-E-N-K-E-R. Uh, the TLDC Twitter handles are a great place to be connected and to get all the information. So um, at TLDCast is one and at the TLDC is another. You can Google search that. I think there might be an underscore between the, the and the TLDC. Yeah, and, and I'll share those in the in the notes as well. Oh, great. OK. Yeah. So those are great way, places to do it. Uh, LinkedIn as well. Um, I use LinkedIn quite a bit. Uh, and especially for professional stuff like this. So feel free to, to reach out to me on LinkedIn um, as well. Um, I, you know, I enjoy uh, a lot of groups uh, um, there and, and sharing my knowledge there. But um, tldc.us is the main website for TLDC. So I would encourage you to go there and uh, uh, just register up for the newsletter. We don't spam you too much, but uh, the, the newsletters that comes out are packed with information and all of the different things that the organization is doing and working on and, and uh, how people can collaborate with us and, and, um, and really just help their careers grow by being engaged in an active uh, community of like-minded professionals. All right. What would be your final or the last word of advice or wisdom for today? Uh, I would say don't panic. Uh, it's going to be okay. Things are changing fast, but it's not as fast as some people will tell you, uh, but faster than others will tell you. So stay engaged, keep learning, get connected to a community And it really just enjoy the work that you're doing. The work that we do in training, learning, and development really at the end of the day is about people. It's about helping people. And if you're not the type of person that is in it to be helpful and to help people, then yeah, maybe you need to be going into something else. Uh, but that's we're a people business, and that's, that's something everybody really needs to remember despite all of this fantastic technology. Well, thank you, Brent, for taking the time to speak with us today and enjoy the rest of your day in the sunny valley of Phoenix. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the conversation. I love talking about this stuff. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to exsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.